Hey, Adam, you know, once again, the most wonderful time of the year is Comic-Con. It's my favorite time of the year, it's true. And it's coming up. It mm -hmm. might have already passed for people, but you walk every year incognito yes. in a costume that you've been working on. At least one. At least one. And this year, it's a project that, it's a culmination of it's, a project that you've been working on for a long time. For the longest time. Um, this might be one of the longest unfinished projects in my roster. Wow. And, and it's this guy. It's, it's one this. of my all favorite costumes on the planet. This is a replica of the spacesuit from Alien. The environmental suit when yes. they walk into the derelict, and it's Kane's spacesuit. Exactly. It's John Hurt's spacesuit, the one that he's wearing when he gets the face hugger on his face. And that's because it's yellow. Yes. The yellow bands. The, and actually, all of the, each of the suits, a lot of people don't realize when they watch the movie, but each of the suits was color-coded to a character. Right. There's a blue there's band. There's a blue, there's a pink, there's a yellow, uh, mm -hmm. and Ripley's is white. Uh, so they really wanted some separation, like each of these suits was issued to the person. But Kane was the, the first one attacked by the facehugger. Yeah. So that's the one that we, that we see most of. Yes. And it's really unique spacesuit design. Well, so it, the, the actual original design comes from uh, Jean Giraud uh, Mobius, mm. uh, the famous comic book artist. Mobius was, along with Giger, part of the original design team for the great unfinished Dune. Yes. Uh, which the entire art department of Dune ended up sort of moving over and working on yep, Alien. Because it's the same writer, Dan Ex O'Bannon. Exactly. Uh, now, Mobius only spent about a week or two on Alien, but his first sketches of the environmental suit were really close to what John Mollo, the costume designer, and ended up uh, constructing. And it is... It's sort of an amazing amalgam of different styles. You've got this samurai armor. That's what everyone calls it, the look, samurai shoulder pads and the armor the, plating. The cricket padding. The, the spacesuit gloves are basically Cooper hockey gloves. There's no nothing to them except that they're painted and they have some labels on them and they're slightly weathered. So I noticed you have a binder there of just research material. Can you walk us through well, the beginning process from screen caps? What were the parts that you needed to identify and what were the parts uh, you needed to create? Well, okay, so uh, a lot of these parts come from castings off of original molds. Mm passed down through the ages from different people and different, you know, people in the industry it's, and stuff like that. And then uh, many of them are also scratch built because the original parts were lost to posterity. Right. From what I recall, they made two suits for John Hurt. Well, and they, yeah, and uh, like any film, they're going to make more than one costume for each character, but there's also two whole sizes of suit uh, in the film. So when the astronauts come into the space jockey room and they see the space jockey and it looks really big, it looks really big because the actors are actually not the adults, they're they're actually kids in a three-quarter size suit. That's John Borman's son, John Borman, the director of uh, many movies, including the original Excalibur, and Ridley Scott's son, and one other kid. And there's some photos behind the scenes of these kids in the suits just looking so happy. Just some happy. perspective tricks. Not like the actors. The actors, like Veronica Cartwright and John Hurt and Tom Skerritt, these suits were a nightmare for them. They were passing out of heat exhaustion all the time. Ventilation. They didn't. I don't exactly know why they didn't turn on the ventilation. If you look at some of the shots that I have from inside the original suit parts, you can see that there's a fan built to the base of the tube that goes from the helmet to the backpack. But I guess they didn't turn it on for sound. But now you've built that in. Yes. It's, it's, you gotta walk around Comic-Con with exactly. that. Exactly. Now, the, probably the most uh, intense bit of problem solving that I did on this suit was a lot of the sewing problem solving. I didn't make this suit. Um, uh, my friend Steve Laboito, who's a, a, a RPF member and an amazing, amazing model maker, um, he has worked with me on this over the years. And his wife, Danita, is an incredible seamstress and did all this work. Um, but way back in the early days of research on this, I managed to see a shot of somebody looking at this lacing, this mm -hmm. weird lacing that, that yep. makes up the arms. And I couldn't figure out where to find it or what it was or what it was from. You always can try to think like a model maker, like where would they have gotten something like that? Is it off a piece of clothing? And then somebody peeled back and I could see a little flower under there. And by taking that flower to the amazing Brightex Fabrics here in San Francisco, they sent me to the design center in San Francisco where someone was able to tell me that this is actually edge lacing from French broderie for lingerie. 
There's lingerie on the alien environment, yeah. just the edge. And, and it's really expensive. It's like $20 a, <laughs> a, a yard, and it takes like many, many yards to make one of these. Also, this quilted uh, twill fabric on the, on the pads and the leg pads is also very difficult to find. There was a, a ton of problem solving for all of the different textures and parts and pieces that meet each other on the costume. Uh, and that took me months and months and months and months. And then I was able to pass on that information to Danita, who then refined my bad sewing skills mm -hmm. into a, a, workable, a, a workable master costume. And it is exact to the original in every last detail. Uh, it, it Velcros up the front with yellow Velcro. The shirt and pants are separate, not like Ripley's. Ripley's white suit at the end of the movie is actually a One. single piece jumpsuit. Uh, I also have all sorts of working lights on it. And if you flip uh, these two backpack switches the on back. the backpack, yep. Um, they actually lighting. They oh, light up. Oh, lighting on the inside. Yep, the lights on the inside of the helmet wow. and on the back of the helmet. You can see back here. Yeah. The uh, four status lights. Now I have gone with some more modern LEDs, mm -hmm. which means they're brighter. And here, where he, uh, the original suit had a really bright, like xenon element, yeah. I put uh, LED car headlight bulbs. Okay. Now, uh, also, it's very interesting. Um, most movies about space suits have lighting from inside that makes it very difficult to see. This is unique in that the lighting comes from outside and down onto the actor, and I feel like, I, I, I can't know, but I feel like that was on purpose to sort of increase the claustrophobic feeling from inside the suit, because in the movie, they look so sort of lonely, that little yes. face in the middle of this. Oh, you see, helmet. you don't see much of the detail of the suit at all. No. It's just like floating faces looking really scared and sweating. Exactly, and the detail is, Frankly, somewhat ridiculous when you look at these hieroglyphics of the etched brass on the sides. Why would that be there? Yeah. Who would need that? Why would this be made out of bronze? I mean, really what it ends up feeling though like is a very well-used, work-a-day, purpose-built piece of hardware that is you know, long in the tooth. For like the space it, truckers. And yeah, and it helps you understand that these guys are out in the middle of nowhere and they don't have the great equipment. They don't yeah. have the modern stuff. Yeah. They just want their end of the share, that yes. contract. Um, now, we saw this at Comic-Con two years ago. Prop Store of London, Stephen yes. Lane, yeah. has one of the screen use he suits. Has, he has Kane's original suit. The Kane, but it's even he doesn't have the, all the complete hardware. No, no. And, and the, some it, of his pieces, like the chest piece. Some of his piece. pieces come from some of the same lineage as some of my pieces yeah. do. Uh, and it's, you know, with, with prop collecting like this, a lot of times these things get split off and split up and it's very hard to gather them back together. Steven's piece is, is an amazing thing and I love that it exists. And I took hundreds of pictures of it mm -hmm. when it was at Comic-Con. It was very funny because I, I wore this knit cap and sort of bolted out to the middle floor, <laughs> took a whole bunch of pictures and then bolted back to my hotel room. <laughs> So is this gonna be comfortable? Can you walk around in this? Um, I can walk around in this. It is actually quite comfortable. Uh, all of the stuff, uh, there's a, a padded neck piece, which I still have to make. That's the last part that I have to make. And then I have to weather it. I, I know this, the bronze stuff looks quite weathered. And this is a multi-step process of a black undercoat, bronze overcoat, and then phthalo greens and yellows and greens and stuff mm. to give this verdigris sort of rotted patina, yeah. copper patina. Um, I will take an airbrush and also some spray paint and some fuller's earth to the suit to make it look really old. I will get hot in this. So I actually have a cool shirt which is, that's a brand like name, and it's got a uh, tubing sewn Just in like it. Just like the astronauts. Just like the astronauts. They actually make these for uh, auto racers. Oh, okay. Specifically when they're racing for six, yeah. seven hours at a time, they can totally overheat. Um, now, uh, in a car, you often have a cooling, chilling unit that mm -hmm. circulates mm -hmm. cold water yep. around you to and draw the radiator, heat away. And yep. Um, this uh, is a much more portable unit that I've got where it's an aerosol can of cooling fluid. Uh, of a coolant that you spray about, I think, once every 10 minutes. It depends. Uh, it depends how hot I get in this. Oh, also, I have, actually, in the backpack, I have a fan. There's a fan. So I will have air blowing around me, and when I wear the helmet, it doesn't fog up. And it's Comic-Con, so it'll be noisy anyway, so you're not gonna be, it's not gonna be intrusive. Exactly, I do, now, this will be shown after I've worn this on the floor. Yes. Um, the thing I'm very excited about, which I haven't yet seen, but I, my, Frank Ippolito is casting me up a face hugger from original face hugger molds for Alien. Um, these don't really exist in the world. This is a very lovely thing that I'm getting access to. And so to hide my identity out on the floor, I will have a face hugger I was gonna ask. over 
the, the visor so that people can't see that it's me under there. Oh, oh, and I'll be not wearing my glasses just to help obfuscate. It. Having that face hugger lets you look wander around. Now, how are we gonna communicate with you? Like, uh, I have invested, finally, in a walkie-talkie system. I've bought some <laughs> classic Motorola okay. four-channel CP200s, uh, and I will have uh, earbud in there, inside there, so that we can talk to each other. Uh, this, there, there are microphones that I haven't installed, um, which is funny. As I was problem solving, finding some of the parts and pieces for the backpack, there are these big paddle switches. And I was looking at toggle switches galore, toggle, toggle, toggle switch. I um, mean, you know, you know, just do Google image searches and start refining, right? You find something that looks close and you grab that, see what that's called, and do searches for that. I really weeks and I couldn't find it. And I started thinking, okay, this is, this is England, late 70s. What sort of weird switches would they, they so they, they were the standard toggle switches, they didn't go to the hardware store. Where else would you go to get toggle switches? Auto parts store, England, Lucas Electric. Hmm. Lucas is the maker of the wiring harnesses and the wiring for MGs and midgets and, and all those British cars that are you know, often derided as having terrible electrics. In fact, Lucas Electric is often referred to as the Prince of Darkness because the electrics don't work very well, but their switches are very distinctive as toggle switches with these big plastic paddles, and that's what's on there. But also, those same plastic paddles are used as the microphone elements uh, in this helmet. So I'll just tape a little microphone element to the back of that it. so it's accurate. And I, I suppose you won't be using your nameplate. I won't be using my nameplate. Uh, yes, each of the suits has the nameplate of the character on it, and I had all the etched brass done for it, and of course I couldn't resist having my own name done, but I will put Kane there so that everyone knows it's wow. uh, supposed to be John Hurt in there. This is, this is um, 10 years, wow. 10 years long this project, and now it is finally reaching fruition. All right. And, uh, and well, Steve Loboito finished his years ago. Yeah, I've, I've seen photos from Dragon Con like 2009. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's way ahead of me on this, but he has been a great guide, a great, uh, 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 I've bounced ideas off of him and him off of me. We are, we are both passionate collectors along the sphere, uh, and he's absolutely been a, a partner in the whole way down. I mean, that's what a holy grail prop project is yes. supposed to be like. Yes. It's awesome. Very exciting. We'll I cannot wait to see the response on the floor. On the floor at Comic-Con. And you can find more stuff from Comic-Con, all the other props we have on tested.com. We'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.